The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. We appreciate you listening to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. We don't do this podcast because we are former addicts. We don't do this podcast because we have loved ones who have suffered from addiction. We do this podcast because we feel that addiction is one of the biggest problems facing the world today, and that no matter who you are, no matter your religion, no matter your income status, no matter your race, no matter anything about you, addiction affects you. This podcast is a free resource for anybody looking for help with addiction. If you would like to help us in our fight against addiction, go to www.patreon.com slash the addiction podcast 273. That's www dot patreon dot com slash the addiction podcast two seven three and make a donation of whatever amount you would like. Thank you for supporting us. Hello, my name is Joni Siegel and welcome to the addiction podcast point of no return. This is the last podcast of 2023. We sincerely hope that you have gotten into treatment if you need treatment. And if not, then our wish for the new year is going to be that that's the year that you get clean and sober, because that's why we do this podcast. We are all about help and giving people hope. Today's episode is episode number 356. We are almost done with our seventh year. And before I get into the interview we're going to do today, I just want to remind you to please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. And also please give us a five-star rating. That way when people are looking for help with addiction, they can listen to our podcast and get some resources or get some inspiration. Please also check out our YouTube channel, subscribe, and give us a thumbs up on our videos. If you'd like to be notified of when our videos go up, ring the bell. Today's episode is an interview with a lady named Colleen Schaefel. Colleen Schaefel's childhood in Minnesota was upended when both of her parents became alcoholics. As her father's addiction escalated, he lost his job, home, and family bonds. But through it all, Colleen remained dedicated to helping him, making countless trips to detox and rehab centers over nearly two decades. It was a painful journey that tested Colleen's own mental health and strength, but she persevered by setting healthy, healthy boundaries, practicing mindfulness, reframing negative thoughts, and leaning on the love of family. Without further ado, let's talk to Colleen Schaefel. Colleen uh, Schaefel, hi. Hi. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for having me, Joni. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm interested in hearing your story. Give us a little bit of background before you had to deal with what you had to deal with, but give us a little background on what life was like before that. Uh, well, life before that um, would have been my childhood before 15 years of age. And I grew up in Twin Cities of Minneapolis, so West Suburbs, um, and pretty, had a pretty normal, happy childhood. Um, five siblings, loving parents. I'm the second oldest of six. And we had a big extended family, or still have a big extended family, and we'd have them over quite a bit. Get-togethers with cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents and friends. And all of these gatherings, um, which were probably most weekends, there was never alcohol involved. Hmm. Um, it was really just more of socializing. It was a lot about the kids. It was a lot about having fun and laughter. But alcohol didn't really come into my parents' lives or our lives as a family and affect us until I was about 15 years old. And, and do you know, ahead. I'm sorry, but do you know what changed then? Or maybe you're about to tell me that, but that just... Yeah, it, I think... I I don't know exactly. I was 15, right? I don't know how it all started with my parents. But when we moved, um, I think is how it started. We moved to our cabin in Wisconsin. So my dad had bought a shell of a cabin. Um, and we ended up moving up there <clears throat> as our new home, right? My dad had this dream he was going to build. They were going to retire there someday. And he was still finishing work in the Twin Cities and had some long days. And then he would be finishing the cabin, 
And we lived in a little rental cabin. There was five of us kids at the time that moved up there. My older brother didn't come with. And we were just getting adjusted to school and friends. And my parents started to go to the bars. That's what you did up in, you know, North Wisconsin. And so they started inviting drinking into their lives. And I think that's where things changed. Um, my mom's family has had a lot of problems with it. My dad somewhat. But my dad really didn't ever, I wouldn't have considered him an alcoholic until his drinking started at my, when I was 15 years old. Wow. So they decided to kind of move, change their whole location, and they kind of changed their lives. Yes, so absolutely. Speak. Yeah. And I, and it, when they started drinking, it wasn't something I was real aware of. I was trying to make friends. I was going to school, but I knew finances was an issue. I knew we were moving into this unfinished cabin that my dad was building and making beautiful. But I kind of saw it through my, both my parents' eyes where it was like, wait a second, my mom's sick and throwing up or my dad's gone a lot, what's going on? And then I realized, you know, more through my dad that that things had changed and that they were splitting up and he moved out. My mom started drinking then and would be gone, you know, sometimes overnight. And I was 16, my brothers were 13, 10, six years old, and my little sister was three. So when she wasn't home, I confronted her and said, you know, I know dad's drinking and gone, but we need a parent. And so she went to treatment. So she got help, but she left for treatment about an hour and a half away and stayed there for a month. So the kids and I were on our own. You're, you're how old? I was, well, I just turned 16. But, so we had a car and a license and all that. Yeah, it was wow. tough. It was, wow. I mean, a 16 year old and you have three younger siblings yeah, four, four younger four siblings. Four younger siblings, yeah. sorry. You said you had an older brother, so there were six all together? Yeah, six all together. Okay, yeah. okay. Well, four, I mean, you're not, sorry, you're not supposed yeah, to have was, to take care of them all at that age. Yeah, and we had a lot of hope that our mom would get better, and she did. You know, she came back and was sober. But during that time, I'd say that's probably how I got so close to my siblings. I'm still close to them today, and we together you know, when went through years and years of my dad's alcoholism helped him. Um, and he and they were so little, but we just kind of did what we needed to do. My mom left me some money and we were poor. So we had food stamps as well that she left us and an old station wagon that had a hole in the front seat, the passenger seat car, we'd cover it with a carpet. <laughs> and we'd drive that car to the laundromat and we'd drive that car to the grocery store. And then every Sunday we'd go visit her while she was in treatment. And one of the trips up there visiting her it was hard to see her, but I could tell she was getting better and healthier and ready to be home and be a mom again. I was driving back and I took a wrong turn and I looked up and at ready to pull out. I looked up and the sign on the car, the, the turn I pulled into said Kinney Road and our last name is Kinney, K-I-N-N-E-Y. And I couldn't believe it. Like, how, what are the odds that it was a kidney road? I, I still wonder if I dreamed it, but my brother says, no, you didn't. But he jumped out of the car, tried to knock the sign down, was frustrated and trying to get it down. And I just said, we'll come back and get it another time. It's okay. I'll just get back in the car. And I just looked at my siblings in the rearview mirror. My three youngest are in the back. My brother, Al, is sitting next to me in the driver's seat. And it was just like, I, I, I just promise them kind of to myself and to them, like, we are going to be okay. You guys are loved. We're going to make it through. We've had such a good family up to this point. It's going to be okay. Um, and my mom came out of treatment. She stayed sober since, and she ended up moving us back to the Twin Cities. And then mm -hmm. my dad, my dad followed a few weeks later and, and lived in an apartment. But that's really when his alcoholism was just getting started. But where was he while your mom was in treatment and you had to take care of the kids? Where was he? I think he was, I mean, I asked myself that too. He'd moved out, you know, he'd kind of moved on and had a relationship. And oh. I think he was just so devastated by it all. He was, wasn't coming around. He'd stop wow. in, but he didn't come back and stay with us. And my mom had called um, one of our uncles and he came to check on us and make sure to make sure we had money and we were established and could, could get, get along. Okay. And I don't know. They just trusted me too. I think they just knew that I could do it. 
Sometimes. The hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 866-989-4499 today. And say the word podcast to get a 10% discount. Or go to newmaninterventions.com and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one-hour consultation with Bobby. We appreciate you listening to the Addiction Podcast Point of No Return. We don't do this podcast because we are former addicts. We don't do this podcast because we have loved ones who have suffered from addiction. We do this podcast because we feel that addiction is one of the biggest problems facing the world today, and that no matter who you are, no matter your religion, no matter your income status, no matter your race, no matter anything about you, addiction affects you. This podcast is a free resource for anybody looking for help with addiction. If you would like to help us in our fight against addiction, go to www.patreon.com slash the addiction podcast 273. That's www.patreon.com slash the addiction podcast 273 and make a donation of whatever amount you would like. Thank you for supporting us. Well, you made the decision to do it. So yeah, well, yeah. well done you. Okay, you you basically you. were their mom for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was hard, but I think it had to be done. I and mean, I think my mom's counselor thought you have to be in inpatient treatment. And my dad, I don't think he realized. I mean, he says now, I didn't realize what I did to you guys. I didn't realize how much my neglect affected you. And that, yeah. We hear that before. I mean, when someone is addicted, whether it's drugs or alcohol, their attention really isn't on anyone else but themselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So your mom moved you guys back to Twin Cities and then your dad came. And then what occurred after that? So um, I'm, you know, I'm in high school and I wanted to go back to the Twin Cities and graduate from a good high school. I went, I went to college too. I was the first of my immediate family. But my dad came, he he lived in an apartment somewhat close to us and was the manager there. He'd been at carpentry all his life and lost his carpentry business. So he was like the landlord and the manager, but he was still drinking. Um, and the kids would sometimes go over there. I was with friends and, you know, in, in high school. So I didn't always join them. But when I did join them, it was like, he's drinking, I think. And I call my mom and let her know. And if it seemed bad, she'd go get them. And and sometimes it's like, you know, she was dating and getting ready to marry this person. Um, So I think my dad thought he could manage it, but his drinking continued. He got DWIs. He lost his license. He eventually was evicted from the apartment and then he'd end up in detox. So it got pretty bad. Um, You know, I mean, it got to the point where he wouldn't call unless he needed help or had been drinking for several days and he really had trouble getting sober on his own. So like one Christmas Eve, I came home from college. My brother, my next closest brother and I were gonna go pick him up. He was gonna go to our our big family gathering and we hadn't heard from him. And it's like, he's probably drinking. I told my brother, we're not gonna go over there and get him. And we've heard from him and sure enough, he was drinking, but he said, you know, he doesn't sound that bad. So we go to pick him up. And he's definitely bad. He's not doing well at all. And so that was one of many first trips to detox, you know, where we bring them to detox. We buzz the ringer. They come out, do a breathalyzer. And the breathalyzer said 0.4. I thought, like, breath alcohol level 0.08 is legal limit. 0.4, I mean, I had learned in high school, like, that's where you can have alcohol poisoning. He needs to be in the hospital. And they said, no, not someone like your dad. This isn't his first visit here. You know, he's, we'll we'll help him through withdrawals. And so he'd get out of detox um, and he'd kind of just start that cycle again. He did have a period um, for like two or three years in the late nineties that he was sober. Um, And he had a couple of periods of that, like between 2000 and 2008, but this cycle went on 
to the point where you know he became homeless. He we didn't know where he was. We couldn't get a hold of him sometimes for weeks. Oh. Um, and it was just it was really hard. It was, yeah. You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. We appreciate you listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. We don't do this podcast because we are former addicts. We don't do this podcast because we have loved ones who have suffered from addiction. We do this podcast because we feel that addiction is one of the biggest problems facing the world today, and that no matter who you are, no matter your religion, no matter your income status, no matter your race, no matter anything about you, addiction affects you. This podcast is a free resource for anybody looking for help with addiction. If you would like to help us in our fight against addiction, go to www.patreon.com slash the addiction podcast 273. That's www.patreon.com slash the Addiction Podcast 273, and make a donation of whatever amount you would like. Thank you for supporting us. Yeah. But you, I can commend you just for, for your forgiveness and yeah. sticking with him. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I would say I couldn't have done it without my siblings. Like we, they helped. And I have an uncle, that's my dad's brother, who would would always be the one he'd call you know even when I was in college and then after college and I'm moving out and I'm on my own and even getting married it's like we can't get a hold of your dad something's going on he's probably in another drinking binge he'd go to treatment he'd be sober for a little while but it was like we just my brothers and I got so used to like okay now should we go find him he hasn't answered the phone for three days now should we figure out where he is or is he at his apartment or whatever halfway house he might stay at and he'd stay sober for periods out after treatment in a halfway house until he got around the same crowds, couldn't get a job. It's hard when you don't have a license. So I remember one time my brother and I going to his apartment because he hadn't answered the phone in three, four days. He wasn't answering his buzzer. And I came around the outside of the apartment building because he was on the main floor. And I you know, looked in the window and there he was laying on the ground. And we don't know if he's alive or dead. Um, and so until I could slide that window open and hear him snoring, and then that's the relief of, okay, he's alive. Um, and then it's like, okay, now what do we do? And I looked right. around the apartment and I could tell like he's been drinking for days. There's bottles around, there's cigarette buds filled, filling the ashtrays. There's no food in the fridge. Uh, so I know he's been on a drinking binge. And what we started to learn is if we just took him right then to detox while he's in the car, he could get sick while he's in the car. Sometimes it's a matter of, is he going to go through withdrawals? Then he started to tell us that he can't get sober without shaking so bad or having hallucinations or he's even seized. Right. So we would sometimes have to pick up a little bit of alcohol and give it to him in the car so that he wouldn't go through withdrawal. Yep. And I remember one time driving in the car, it was just so, like it was just so sad, kind of suffocatingly sad, and you're angry and you're, you know, frustrated. And I just had to break the silence. And so I said to my brother who's driving and my dad's moaning and groaning in the front seat, on this next turn up here, just get really close to the edge and let's just open the door and kick him out. And he'll go rolling down the cliff and nobody will know. Shut the door and and we can be all done with it. And it's just so terrible, but we had to use our humor to get through it. Cause you're, it's this both of like, we love our dad so much and we want him to get better. And then you're helping him get better for the 10th time. And you're like, when is this going to end? I remember thinking in my twenties, like, can't wait to be done with it someday. Right. Right. I don't, I don't think ill of you for saying that. 
I can understand it. Thank you, Joni. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. And we had so many, you know, kind of jokes about that later that it was just like, what are we going to do with you? You have no idea what you're doing, you know? And there was times where, um, especially in 2000, he, I was 25. Um, I court ordered him to treatment. I actually took him to court and said he's a danger to himself and others. And my mom helped me with that process. And he got into treatment and he stayed sober for probably two years after that. So we were able to tell him about all these things. And he had remorse. Um, You know, it's hard sometimes to believe that remorse when then two years later, they go back to another relapse. Um, But he finally got sober in 2008. I mean, I was in my 30s when that happened. And it was it was pretty miraculous, but you don't know it at the time. You just think, mm-hmm. okay, this is another treatment that you're going to go through. Here we go again. Yeah. yeah. Here we go again. Um, and I can tell you a little bit about that unless you had any questions. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just listening. Okay. So when um, my dad got to the point, you know, where he, we didn't know where he was. Um, and in 2008, I was 33. I had two, two of my girls or two of my kids were alive. My um, third one wasn't yet. And my dad had been sober during both their births. It was so cool. He came to the hospital and he was sober during that time. But they were fairly little. And, and just before he got sober, he had probably the worst year of his life. He was homeless. He was not working. He wasn't eating. He was really just living on the streets and surviving. And we were kind of aware and kind of not. We had started to let go and just feel like it maybe it's just not going to get better. And then he calls me one night um, and says, you know, I hadn't heard from him a while. So I was surprised I didn't recognize the phone number. So he must have been using someone's phone. He said, I'm, I'm, um, I want to get better. And it was a different like tone of sincerity. Like he definitely was drinking a little slurry, but he said, I need to know that you still have hope for me. Mm. You know, do you still believe in me? And that's why it's the name of my book. I wrote a book, Do You Believe in Me? It's the memoir that you can get on Amazon. And it's it, it his kind of desperateness was something is different here. He is asking, Do you still believe in me? Do you have hope in me? I need that or life's not worth living. So he was at this brink of, do I just drink myself to death or do I get better? Kind of his point of no return. His point of no return. Yep. That's why we call the podcast that because we figure at some point someone who's addicted has that realization that they either want to, they're either going to get better or they're going to spend their life in jail or die. Yeah, absolutely. And he was at that point, probably not the first time he's at that point, but this was kind of that last breaking point or the point of no return. And he said uh, to me, um, you know, I just need to hear that. I said, of course, I believe in you, dad. And I still have hope and I still love you. And he said, will you meet me tomorrow in detox? And it was the, the detox that he preferred. It wasn't the downtown Minneapolis detox. It was one of the suburbs mission. And he said, I said, well, where are you? And he said, I'm not going to tell you that. Here he was under a bridge in Minneapolis. Mm. homeless at the time, had a blanket, had a bottle, trying to get through the night. It's the winter. It's probably zero degrees. And I'm wondering, how are you not going to, you know, die tonight? But he wouldn't tell me where he was because he didn't want me getting out looking for him. He couldn't get into the detox there. He was going to wait till the morning till the other one was open. And he said, if I make it through the night, I want you to meet me tomorrow. So I didn't sleep that night, obviously, very well at all. I got his phone call. He was on his way to Mission Detox. I met him there, and that's when he asked me to court order him again. He said, I want you to do the court order. When I did that in 2000, he was not happy with me. He was Mm -hmm, really upset. And this time he said, if I do that and I leave treatment or I go back to drinking, you know, the cops pick me up and they bring me to jail. So I I have to do it if you do it. And there's funding and there's this whole setup that they can do with court order. So I did it again. I mean, I met him at detox and I thought you look just as haggard and terrible and rough as you do when you're in here. How can you possibly mean that you're going to really change this time? It's been 18 years of this back and forth. And, you know, I, I had let go. I had done so many things in my life, setting up boundaries to, to separate from this and still loved him. But I knew 
I had to do this. Like, okay, yes, I'll do one more thing. I'll do this one more thing, but I, I got to be done. I have my own life, my, my own, you know, happy family. And I just, you know, I wanted a relationship with him back and him sober, but it was exhausting. Um, and he, he pulled through. I mean, he went to treatment. He says God cured him of his craving. This gnawing craving that he would have every single day to drink or get drunk was just gone. He started like, reading the Bible again and really just living a God, living a life that God would be proud of and or with him guiding. And he had what he wanted back the most, which was a relationship with his children and grandchildren. Because now his children are all adults and there's, you know, probably at that time, seven grandchildren and now there's 12. So he knew there was something better. And he always calls it, you know, like you have to have a purpose to be sober. It's not like you're trying to get sober just to do nothing. You know, he needed a greater love and a greater purpose and that's his kids and grandkids. Wow. And so we have a good relationship now. I'd say it's, it's restored. It's honest. I'm helping him write a book about his experience, like his memoir. So he's been clean and sober for 15 years. 15 yes. Years? One slip wow. in those 15 years, but clean and sober and living wow. in an apartment. And basically retired now, you know, he's a vet, so he's um, has some assistance and that stuff, but he's living in an apartment and well, he has if, a relationship if, with us. If you tell him about the interview, tell him that your interviewer said very well done because, because we know we've talked to other people who are addicted to alcohol. And first of all, it's absolutely deadly to come off if, unless you go to a hospital or go to a treatment facility. Absolutely. Yeah. The withdrawals can be terrible. But also it's just what people don't understand is that, you know, a lot of people say addiction is a disease. We don't necessarily agree with that, but we don't, yeah, you know, we're not going to make anybody yeah. wrong for it. But the the bottom line is when you're addicted, it's physical, it's mental, it's spiritual. And a lot of people who've never experienced that think, mm -hmm. why can't you just stop? Right. Because it's addictive physically, mentally, and spiritually, Absolutely. and alcohol, especially physically. That's why it's so dangerous when people come off of it, you know? And so, I just, I know from every time I talk to someone who is a former addict or former alcoholic, you know, I just, it, I very well done to your dad because we know yeah, it's not it's easy. So, yeah, it is. It's so difficult. And he agrees totally. It's not a disease. He's like, it's not a disease. It's not cancer. It's not, he described it as this craving, like this, this craving is something you're allergic to. He described it like a craving, like to, where you're anaphylactically allergic to a bee sting, but you crave to be stung. It just makes no sense. And he, and of course, you know, he went through periods of sobriety when have the relationship back, but he never really like forgave himself. Mm. And he needed, you know, he needed to get right with God to be able to forgive himself. He also realized, you know, this is, I'm now sober so that I can enjoy my life. I'm not struggling to be sober. And so he said, if I didn't have you kids, if, so, I mean, that's my message too, to like those who are dealing with somebody with an addiction, it's exhausting and you got to take care of yourself, but it's, you can't give up hope on them. Otherwise they probably won't get better. I mean, they might get sober, but they're not really going to have the life they wanted. Yeah. So keeping that hope alive and, and, making sure they know that there's somebody that cares about them. You're not caring for them anymore, but you care about them. And I would say that, well, I mean, some of the things I learned, and that's why I want to, I'm building a website, kickroad.com, and I want to put on there, you know, free things for people to be able to go to and say, like, you know, how did you let go or how did you set up boundaries and put resources on there of other people's books and resources? Because my mom showed me this poem, and it was about letting go does not mean you don't care anymore. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you stop loving them. It means that you are going to carry on with your own life. You know, it means you stop trying to control it. And that's what I was doing a lot when I go pick them up or, or I'd use it as my excuse to kind of stall in my own life. Or, or it's enabling is another enabling. way of saying, yeah. It. yeah. Yeah. And I know parents have to do that a lot with their children. You just had to do it Swip swap, flip flop. You had to do it with your father, but yeah. um, yeah. Well, very well done, you, 
and for the <laughs> life you. that you have and very well done for just never losing hope and never stopping loving your dad because he's now evidence of that love and that hope um, today, which is huge. Well done. Yeah. Thank you, Joni. Thank you Absolutely. so much. And yeah. your book, say the name of your title, to say the title of your book again, and it's on My Amazon. My memoir anyway. is Do You Believe in Me by Clean Shaffle. Okay. And it's a memoir of addiction, hope, and family bonds. Um, and then I'm starting a website, kinneyroad.com. It'll be out January 1st. And it's a lot about the boundaries, letting go, self-awareness, just really helping people find that freedom and happiness in spite of a loved one's addiction. What a great way to start the new year. <laughs> Thank you. So and for much. those of you listening, if you need help, start your new year. Go to kinneyroad.com or .org? Dot com. Dot com. Go to Kinney, K-I-N-N-E-Y? Yes. Kinneyroad.com. Great way to start your new year. Colleen, thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. Really appreciate your story. And once again, tell your dad, from me, very well done. I will. Thank you so much, Joni. Thank you for listening. Once again, the website, kinneyroad.com, goes up on January 1st. And today is the 28th of December. So there's a gift for you for New Year's. I want to wish you a happy New Year. If you are in addiction yourself, my wish for 2024 is that you get clean and sober. If you have a loved one who is addicted, my wish is that they become clean and sober, sober for 2024. Happy New Year, everybody. We'll be back with another interview in 2024. You have been listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information, reach out to us on Facebook or go to www.theaddictionpodcast.com. Our email is theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com.